This is you at Smith's Cove, Oak Island, Nova Scotia, Canada. This is a spot somewhere here, and we don't know for sure, that in 1795, those three young boys allegedly found this depression in the ground. Right? So they go home to Chester, and they get picks and shovels and pry bars and buckets and all the equipment they can lay their hands on, according to the story, come back, <coughs> dig down about two feet, thinking that it's pirate treasure, right? Because they brought stories of pirates from uh, northeastern United States. The people who were living here at the time were called planters, the planters. They came, it was prior to the American Revolution. So there was a large influx of northern New Englanders into the Chester, this whole area, Lunenburg and what have you. So they come over here and they dig down. At two feet, they go through a layer of flagstone. At 10 feet, they hit a layer of oak logs embedded into the sides of this shaft. This is a well-defined, according to the story, 13-foot diameter shaft so you can see trick marks in the sides of this hard clay. The story is they get down to maybe 25, 30 feet and realize it's too much for three young boys. Now, when I tell you that they've been searching for treasure for 221 years, that's not entirely true because there's periods of inactivity when nothing happens on Oak Island. And the first period is not until 1803 when a company comes here from north of Truro called the Onslow Company. Onslow is a little community north of Truro. So they come here, right? And they re-excavate the pit, and they're going down, 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 down. Every 10 feet, they hit a layer of oak logs. On top of some of the oak logs, there's charcoal. Some of them, there's coconut fiber. You gotta remember, the nearest coconut tree is 2,500 miles from here. Some of them had rock, little small little stones. And the reports are that there was something carved on the stone. But they're, remember, they're not looking for stones. They're not looking for coconut fiber. They're not looking for that. They're looking for treasure. So a lot of these things, when they do find them, and this is going right back in history, were just thrown by the wayside. If it's not shiny, or as David would say, it's not expendable, they weren't interested. That's how we've lost so much here. So they get down to 90 feet, right? That's where they find the stone, right? The stone, and we're still looking for the for the 90 foot stone. We're tracking down a number of leads, uh, and no success yet, but we're still looking. And uh, the stone had marks on it, right? In fact, John Smith, John Smith built his house right to the right of where that large maple tree grew, and he put it in his fireplace, top of his fireplace. Hundreds of people saw the stone. There is no rubbing. There is no drawing. There is no photograph, and there was a photographic crew here in 1861. In fact, that's the earliest photo we have. And, the, and his house was still standing at that point because he died in 1856, but they were using his house and his barn as kind of a headquarters for, for the operations that were going here, on here. Hundreds of people saw the stone. Even back in 1803, there was a tourism uh, faction that was going on. People were coming to the island to see people digging for treasure. Right? You can see in that 1861 photograph, you can see ladies with long white dresses. So they were coming here from Chester to see what was going on. Right? So it was their habit each day to take a, a, an iron bar and sound down to the next level. So this happened late on a Saturday night. Okay, They're at 90 feet. The men are exhausted. They're working double shift. They're working by lantern and candle. Basically, 80 feet below where we're standing, somewhere in this area here. So they hit something at 98 feet, not 100. And it was a hard sound, right? It was a solid sound. So they knew, okay, we, we must be here, you know? So they thought, okay, well, this is late on Saturday. We're not going to worry about it. Let's, we'll come back. Well, we'll come back on Monday, you know? And being good Presbyterians that they were, they weren't going to work on Sunday. So they come back on Monday morning, and some, some reports said it was late sun, that Sunday, and what do they find but 60 feet of water in the pit? And that's been the problem ever since, trying to control the water. Right? So just to be, give you a little grade 12 physics here, at two levels in the Money Pit area, and the, according to some reports it was 30 and 70, and some it's 40 and 60, they went through 12 to 15 inches of a putty-like substance. Right? So in between all these layers is soil that has started to compress. So you have the oak logs, you have the putty-like substance, and on top of that you have soil, right? So they remove the putty-like substance. In fact, there's reports of the workers taking it home and glazing around their windows with it. 
So, just to go back to grade 12 physics here for a second, if you take a straw and you put it in a glass of water, water will go up the straw, right? It has to find equilibrium, right? However, you take another straw and you put your finger on the top of that straw and you put it in a glass of water. And you can try this experiment to yourself. You know, I didn't invent it. <laughs> the ear pressure contained in that straw prevents the water from going up. It's the same principle here. By removing that putty-like substance at those two levels is like taking your finger off the straw. It activated the hydraulics from Smith's Cove. And there's a flood tunnel coming from Smith's Cove, which is 520 feet long, enters a money pit at 110 feet below the surface. And the water started to come through. And over that 24, 36 hour period, when they stopped working, that's how it filled this thing. And that's been the problem ever since. There are probably 15 major shafts in this area. And I would say maybe 700 <coughs> boreholes in this area. Over a thousand in the eastern end of the island, and over 32 major shafts on the eastern end of the island. And that's not even a tight space, right? Yeah, exactly. It's terrifying. David just went down and he kind of. I like my diving to include fish. Not that. This is the bottom of the cross. Now, if you Google Nolan's Cross, Oak Island Cross, uh, Oak Island Christian Cross, you'll see photographs, diagrams of it on the internet. Um, not a solid cross, only the points on a cross. Right? Made up of five cone-shaped granite boulders, ranging anywhere from size by about five tons, probably 15 tons. Now, from here, and it runs kind of like that on a straight line. It's 867 feet to the top of the cross. Each arm of the cross is 360 feet in length. The angle between the arm and the stem within a fraction of one degree is almost 90 degrees. That's how perfect it is. Now, the reason they call it a Christian cross is 294 feet up along the stem there's another stone or boulder very similar to this. And that represents where Jesus' feet were nailed to the cross. That's why they call it a Christian cross. Right? Now, where the arms and the stem intersect, Fred dug down about three feet and found what he describes, and hopefully we'll get a geologist to look at it. He said it was sandstone. And in profile, looks like the side of somebody's head. You gotta use your imagination a little bit, but if you Google, Nolan's headstone, Oak Island headstone, you'll see photos of it uh, on the internet. Now you can see where the mouth is. Again, you've got to use your imagination a little bit and interpret it. See where the mouth is. You see where a nostril is. You see where the eye socket is. And definitely in the temple or forehead region, there's an indentation where uh, you could lay a navel cutlass or a navel sword right on, in the temple region. Um, very, let me tell you something, Mother Nature did not do this. Human beings did this. You'll notice that there's excavation around it. Both Dan and Fred do this. When they find a boulder or a stone of interest, and believe me, they think most of them on Oak Island are interesting, <laughs> they excavate around them or underneath them, and they do that for a reason. If the soil is heavily compacted, then they know that that boulder or that stone has been there probably since the glaciers went through here 10, 15,000 years ago. However, if the soil is disturbed, there's one of two possibilities. Either a farmer moved it, you know, to, or somebody placed it there for a reason. And they lean on that side of the <laughs> coin more so than on the other.